As of my writing of this July 1st of 2020, the real unemployment rate is currently hovering at around 18%. Due to the recent economic recession, as well as the half-assed quarantine, tens of millions of Americans have found themselves furloughed from work. The American economy is amidst full collapse, ravaged with pandemic, skyrocketing unemployment rates, countrywide protesting triggered from the unjust killing of George Floyd, and all the federal governments can do at this time is continue to kick the can down the road by pumping trillions in liquidity into the stock markets. As a wise man once said, there is a great chaos under heaven. The situation is excellent. But why are all these people without work right now? After all, traditional right-wing orthodoxy teaches us that if somebody doesn't have a job, it's because they're not doing a good enough job trying to find a job. And if they're living on welfare or government assistance of some kind, then they're just a leech parasiting off of the system. Isn't it funny how the very same people that have been telling us for years that we do not have enough money for free college or single-payer healthcare are now signing off on multi-trillion dollar stimulus packages to bail out the stock market? Utilizing Keynesian economics and modern monetary theory whenever it comes to securing the wealth of the powerful, but then going full libertarian and cap whenever it comes to making the economy a little bit less top-heavy. Why is it that whether the economy is in a period of expansion or a period of contraction, there's always perpetually a sect of the population that is terminally unemployed? Well, I have two answers to that question. The first one is that capitalists actually want a sect of the population to be periodically unemployed. The logic generally goes like this. Don't like the job? Have complaints about the working conditions or the low wages? Well then there's the door. After all, there's somebody right around the corner who is desperate enough to take your place. And the second reason goes back to the law of value. Labor power, like everything in capitalism, is a commodity. It is to be purchased, to be bought and sold on the free market. And since human labor time and labor power is the only thing that creates new value and creates new goods, when the demand for goods in a given sector of the economy or a given industry is high, then the demand for labor to produce said goods is also high, which means there's more employment, wages go up. Conversely, during periods of economic contraction, when consumer goods are devalued and the demand for said consumer goods is driven down, by extension, the demand for said labor power to produce said goods is also driven down. And this is how you end up with large reserves of people who are either unemployed or have their wages devalued, their benefits cut, etc. This is a periodic problem that is pandemic to the capitalist system. As a consequence of the increased unemployment and the diminished value of wages, people start to run out of money to purchase said commodities produced by the industries and firms in the first place, which also contributes to the driving down of demand, which causes the circulation of commodities and goods to strangulate and a deflationary spiral to commence. There is a solution, however, for the government can step in with state-owned enterprises and the nationalization of industry and the direct buying of labor power to produce more goods and commodities and inject more value into circulation. Using a combination of Keynesian economics and modern monetary theory to directly buy labor power, achieve full employment, subsidize consumer spending to increase demand for certain industries, institute economic planning as to overhaul and increase infrastructure, and utilizing a progressive taxes to tax surplus cash out of circulation to circumvent runaway inflation. Outsourcing could be curtailed, jobs could be brought home ashore, and a synthetic economic boom could be created where goods are produced as use values first and commodities second. That is, producing goods and services that people actually need, rather than leaving it up to the private sector to manufacture artificial needs for the sake of producing profits. Oh no, all your hard work in the garden is ruined. Some pesky critter has pilfered your produce. There has to be a better way. <laughs> Introducing the Watch Owl, the best way to keep nature's pests at bay. People who are serious about their barbecue know all about bear paws, the original meat shredders that are sturdy and made in the USA. They're like super sharp forks for your hands and are ideal shredders for pulled pork, chicken, or any other food you want to tear. I rest my case. Now it is at this point one might reasonably ask, where does the money come from to pay for all of this? 
the infrastructure projects, the single payer healthcare, the education, the living wage, and so on. And the simple answer, don't freak out, the government prints the money. They print the money and they directly purchase the labor power from workers. And since human labor power is what creates value and adds value to society, you have these people working with full employment and any surplus cash that is created can simply be taxed out of circulation. Such a program would not only benefit workers because it could be used to reinstitute strong labor laws and bring back unions as well as drive up wages and consumer spending and access to the means of consumption. It would also aid the capitalist class because now they have people coming in and buying the goods and services that they have to offer. Suddenly you have a synthetic boom in the circulation of commodities and goods. And what I'm talking about here is Keynesianism in a nutshell. So why is there such an adamant opposition to such a program? Why is it that even mild milk toast reformers of the Bernie Sanders type are ruthlessly frustrated by the powers that be over and over again? Every night, I'll let the Democrats figure this out. I, I have my own views of the word socialist, and I'll be glad to tell them, share them with you in private. And they go back to uh, the early 1950s. I have an attitude about them. I remember the Cold War. I have an attitude towards Castro. I believe if Castro and the, and the, and the Reds had won the Cold War, there would have been executions in Central Park, and I might have been one of the ones getting executed. And certain other people would be there cheering, okay? So I have a problem with people who took the other side. I don't know who Bernie, uh, Bernie supports over these years. I don't know what he means by social. One week it's Denmark. We're going to be like Denmark. Okay, that's harmless. That's, a, that's basically a capitalist country with a lot of good social welfare programs. Denmark is harmless. He's pretty clearly in the Denmark is he? category. Yeah. Are you sure? How do you know? Did he tell you that? What? It is important to note that capitalism isn't necessarily a rational system. That is to say, the capitalist class are not inherently a rational class or group of people. They are concerned with what makes money now, what makes profits go and flow now. They're only concerned with increasing their own personal consumption and wealth. And implementing such policies would curtail the rate that they may accumulate for personal consumption. In other words, you would have a more egalitarian spread of wealth. There would still be inequality. You would still have millionaires and so on, but you wouldn't have billionaires and people that are on their way to becoming trillionaires right now. The economy wouldn't be as top heavy as it is at the moment. The other reason why is because such post Keynesian policies have dangerous implications for the capitalist system in the long run. For such an economic scheme would mean bringing back unions and workers' participation and control in the production process. In other words, it would pave the way for the logic of socialism in the grand scheme of things. By demonstrating that the state is more than capable of undertaking these projects, of nationalizing industry, of getting everybody to work, and meeting everybody's needs outside of the framework and context of the markets, the implications go to show that in the grand scheme of things that we really don't need the market, that we don't really need the capitalist system in order to prosper, and that there are other ways to enrich society to the benefit of everyone. Such policies, if implemented, would prove that you don't need the capitalist system to create innovation, to improve technology, to raise people out of poverty, to increase living standards, or to do any of the things that liberal demagogues often brag about capitalism doing. It would show that you could go beyond capitalism, not to mention reforms begot reforms. Giving those workers that much more say means that they would eventually be able to take the country in a more socialistic direction over time. And that is the reason why they so ruthlessly frustrate these policies. This is the reason why they get so hostile at the sight of a mild social democrat such as Bernie Sanders. This is the reason why they're constantly railing against these policies and simply denouncing it as socialism. Because in a sense, they're right. Not that it's socialism but that the logic by instituting these policies goes to show that you don't need capitalism. You can transition to a planned economy that works to the benefit of everybody. 
You have to understand that at this point in the development of capitalism, at least here in the first world, where we have the service economy, the rotting infrastructure, the decaying of the productive forces, and the outsourcing, and all of the issues that you see here, this goes beyond maximizing profits. This is about the bourgeoisie maintaining their dominance and hegemony. And the last thing they want is the state stepping in to fix these economic problems. The last thing they want is glaring proof that we don't need their system and that we can do a planned economy. In other words, this is the only system that perpetuates their kind. And even though this alternative would literally benefit everyone across the board, including the capitalist class, because it means people have the means of subsistence necessary to purchase their commodities and consumer goods, they would rather perpetuate the system of neoliberalism, people and planet be damned. In other words, the problem isn't a lack of money or a lack of resources, but a lack of the political will necessary to make this happen, and a lack of organizing from the grassroots and the bottom up to realize the goals that I speak of. So in summary, the money is there, the resources are there. They just happen to be in the hands of a bunch of psychotic junkies that would gladly watch the communities around them burn if it means they get their next fix. And like a bunch of psychotic junkies, it's up to us as an earthly community to bring it to an end.